So, uh, thank you Professor Shen for inviting me uh, into this uh, workshop to uh, do not think that I am going to I mean give a very high level lecture. It is more of sharing my experience of uh, the work that uh, we have carried out in our organization for past 17 years, uh, whatever little things that we have learnt, uh, whatever small challenges that we have overcome. So, it is basically uh, for me uh, it is a nice platform to share those experiences and probably uh, give a little thought here and there. So, that uh, when you are doing those things yourself, uh, you might benefit from those experiences and uh, we all learn from our own mistakes. So, the basic uh, idea of uh, arranging, talk, arranging this talk is that we do not repeat those mistakes and probably learn from each other. So, uh, essentially uh, we work uh, uh, Samid uh, I do not know whether a uh, lot of you may be familiar with it, a uh, lot of you may not be. So, uh, it is an acronym the full form of which is Society for Applied Microwave Electronics Engineering and Research. So, it started in 1983 uh, which came out from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research as a small applied group and then started their own laboratory in Bombay. Uh, so, we have our own uh, laboratory in Bombay inside IIT Bombay. Then in 1989 our Chennai center started and Calcutta started in 1993. Calcutta being the birthplace of millimeter wave as you all know that the first millimeter wave signal generated and transmitted in 1893 by uh, Sir J C Bose in Presidency College. So, uh, a thought was there that probably a millimeter wave laboratory here uh, would benefit the region. So, we started and it was with very small steps that we started because at that time uh, there was almost no infrastructure in the country and nobody knew anything about millimeter wave. So, uh, slowly uh, we started to gather experience and then uh, slowly we started to uh, make systems and uh, make ourselves more aware uh, of the whole thing about millimeter wave. So, today uh, my talk basically my uh, discussion with you probably is mostly on a 60 gigahertz system uh, that we developed at our place, what are the challenges that we faced and what are the basic issues that needs to be addressed when you are working in the front end side like uh, the baseband probably there were a lot of lectures in the past few days, where you have learnt about the protocols and uh, the kind of MAC layer, physical layer etcetera. So, I am talking about the front end where the actual signal gets transmitted. So, when we go uh, for a system design, so what are the things that we need to take care. So, we will be uh, taking care we will start from the top level which starts with the system specifications and link design. So, we start with the link and then come down to the system specification. And once we have the system specification in place, then we can start putting blocks to build the system. So, these blocks uh, will have their own specifications and from the overall system specifications one need to derive the specification of the blocks or the subsystems and components. And of course, uh, when you go one level deeper, then you need to uh, do modeling for all the subsystems that you are designing or the components that you are designing. So, the modeling also comes in two level, one is you model for the subsystem itself like you model an amplifier. Uh, so, that you get the proper uh, input output response of that amplifier that you are looking for and one level deeper is you model the device itself with which you are making the amplifier let us say the FET or the MESFET or the p hemp or a transistor. So, there are two level of modeling available I mean required here. And lastly of course, uh, you require to design a very robust power supply as lot of you are practicing engineers uh, as the feedback I have received. So, you all know the importance of a very good power supply design for any system. And uh, lastly you need to do your system integration and packaging in a suitable format 
and for the environment in which you are looking to operate. So, these are all the issues uh, which comes up during a system design and some of the issues are slightly more challenging when you go at a higher frequency range like 60 gigahertz or uh, uh, more up. So, we are doing system design uh, up to 100 gigahertz for about last 10 years. So, maybe I will be able to highlight some of those issues. So, I will start from a lower level and go to the higher level. So, rather than starting with a system design and specification which probably has been talked about a lot in the past few days, I will start with uh, probably device level modeling which is required to uh, carry out for any system design. So, uh, let us start with uh, the topic of uh, modeling of measurement, modeling and measurement of devices for high frequency circuit design. So, anything, any high frequency circuit that we design will uh, require us to use high frequency devices. So, what are these devices? These devices can be exotic devices like impact, gun, trapat, barit or even a p hemmed, maybe a mesfet, HBT etcetera etcetera but they are uh, active side. In the passive side you may need to use very mundane things like a simple interconnect or uh, some micro strip design, coupler, filter, resistor, inductor, capacitor etcetera etcetera. So, all of these things when we are using in our uh, component or circuit design, they require uh, very good modeling or very good uh, input output macro representation. Uh, so, that when as a designer you are designing it, you are able to capture uh, the true performance of your whole component that you will be designing using this, this kind of uh, components. So, that is why uh, it is a challenge uh, as well as it is fun. So, we start with uh, basically what is a model uh, which we would like to make. So, it is essentially uh, when we are trying to use any circuit element then it is a good enough approximation of behavior. Uh, it can or should be described in terms of physical laws like uh, at a very low frequency we can say that a resistance follows Ohm's law. So, that is a physical law which the resistance follows. Can be approximated using an equivalent circuit in case your uh, component is complex uh, which cannot be approximated with a simple law like Ohm's law it should be we should be able to approximate it using an equivalent circuit and then uh, we should be able to validate it using measured data and in some of the cases we should be able to even formulate the equivalent circuit using measured data. So, these are basic characteristics of a model of any device passive or active that we generally look for uh, when we are doing. So, all modeling basically starts with abstraction. So, any modeling that we do in our life will start with some kind of an abstraction. So, for example, I have put in electrical domain we use lumped abstraction for components like resistor, capacitor, inductor. So, when I am talking about resistor, it is essentially telling me in Maxwell's terms the surface current which flows through a particular cross section of a conductor and how much obstruction that current faces. So, it is a physical phenomenon some current is flowing through one cross section of a electrical conductor and it is facing some abstraction, uh, facing some obstruction. So, that obstruction if you see in a micro level lot of things are happening, electrons are moving from one point to another and then uh, inside you have some kind of an equilibrium. So, all those things are pretty complex if we try to capture all of these in our circuit design it becomes very difficult, very very cumbersome mathematically and from physics point of view very involved. So, all of that has been reduced to one simple term called resistor, which can be captured at lower frequency by Ohm's law. So, we use lumped abstraction for all these kind of phenomena where capacitor is essentially a charge storing device, inductor is kind of a magnetic field storing device. So, all these things they have their own physical laws associated physical laws, but we circuit designers, uh, engineers we like to simplify things as much as possible. So, that uh, ultimately we can make something uh, which works. So, this kind of abstraction are used. They are basic of any modeling work that we do. 
So, what are the essential requirements for modeling? I have put in an arbitrary uh, picture of a simulator essentially. So, we can predict very accurately the behavior of complex circuits in time domain as well as frequency domain that is one thing that we would like to do. Of course, uh, prediction of linear and nonlinear response of elements uh, this is very important when we are going into RF because uh, a lot of RF have got linear approximation. So, even a linear model is very good in most of the cases, but when we are working with power devices then nonlinear takes the front seat. Cutting down on hardware iterations this is uh, as an engineer you should appreciate that earlier when I started working in 2000 then designing an amplifier was more of black magic because simulators were not abundant you will do some hand calculation then probably come up with some kind of a circuit then you will say that the output is not coming at all. So, you keep on changing the capacitor at the output the coupling capacitor and then probably at some point of time you will start getting some output. Then you tweak something there tweak somewhere something else then ultimately after 2, 3, 4 iterations you come up with a final circuit which only you understand nobody else understands in the whole laboratory. You only understand what you have done and if you go away tomorrow then nobody else will be able to reproduce it. So, that was the problem that we faced when we started but that has now I mean it is passed now. Essentially we can now predict up to very high frequency with extremely high accuracy how a circuit will behave and once the total circuit model is made then uh, anybody can take it from there and probably reproduce it in number of times. Uh, so, that is why this is very important this cutting down of hardware iterations and this nowadays is combined with electromagnetic modeling or simulation which has become an invaluable tool because we know that high frequency all these kind of unintended effects will kick in electromagnetic effects which uh, we very conveniently uh, lump under one term called parasitics. So, all electromagnetic effects that kicks in we simply lump it under parasitics, but they are not all the same they are very different phenomena happening at different places of your circuit. Uh, so, they needs to be captured as well when you are trying to design something. So, all these things comes inside your modeling. Uh, I will start with some very basic examples. So, these are early uh, stages uh, everybody has read it uh, probably in their undergrad class. So, a basic example of an NPN <coughs> transistor uh, which uh, we start with either a hybrid pi model or a H parameter model. And as you can see uh, we call it a small signal model mostly and we can represent this two port network using this very simple uh, matrix equation uh, with each parameter or uh, other kind of parameters. So, as you can see uh, why it is called a small signal model. So, uh, essentially we are trying to say that the signal that this device is going to receive is very small in amplitude. So, uh, when it receives a signal then that signal itself does not change the behavior of the device. The behavior of the device remains invariant even when you have applied an RF signal to the input. Okay. The behavior is only determined by the DC bias point of the device and nothing else. Okay. So, but for that to happen your signal level has to be very very low. Like for an example uh, a low noise amplifier that you will be using probably in the front of a receiver will work in a small signal mode because the signal it will be receiving is very very low minus 100 dBm or minus 90 dBm very low signal low level signal. So, that kind of a low level RF signal does not change the behavior of the device appreciably. So, that is why we can uh, say that okay, fine the device behaves as it is if it receives a minus 90 dBm signal or a minus 80 dBm or, or even a minus 70 dBm signal. So, that is where this small signal model comes in and they are very very useful for all kind of low power designs and mostly uh, small signal models the beauty of the small signal models is that they are mostly linear mostly linear in nature. So, as you can see this is a linear equation this is a set of two linear equations. So, this whole uh, structure the equivalent circuit etcetera can be represented using simply two sets of linear equations. But unfortunately life is not simple always. So, uh, feel free to stop me and ask anything in between absolutely no trouble with that. We have 3 hours time total. 
So, uh, as I was telling life is not always very simple. So, eventually you will uh, come up with some kind of requirement where uh, the input that you are pushing through your device is pretty high appreciably high. So, uh, what happens is that as you know for any device if I try to simplify it uh, uh, very very at a very lower level or a very high level. Then uh, if you are putting a high enough RF signal in any transistor uh, you have a diode at the let us say if it is a transistor you have a base emitter diode. So, apart from your amplification which it is supposed to do or any other thing it will also generate some kind of a DC because of rectification action and that DC is going to change your device behavior a bit. Okay. So, that means when we go into large signal model uh, the device characteristics changes with the input signal level which was not happening in case of small signal model. In large signal it is not only a function of your bias point where you have biased it but also a function of the RF signal level which you are trying to push through the device as well as the load and the source impedances that you are actually presenting it in the front and the back. So, this becomes a bit more complex and as you can see uh, we start using start using nonlinear elements into our equivalent circuit. We are using a diode here okay. diode is not a linear element it is a nonlinear element. So, we are using a nonlinear element, we start using dependent current sources, etcetera, etcetera. So, these are still uh, low frequency, a small model or Gamel Kuhn model, I have just put it for representation. We will learn actual high frequency modeling a bit later. So, what is the difference when we start modeling for high frequency uh, rather than low frequency? Where, why you will never come up or never see? a hybrid pi or a h parameter model for a 10 gigahertz p hemp or a 6 gigahertz gas fit. In the data sheet have you ever seen that there is a uh, hybrid pi model or a hybrid parameter model given for a gas fit at 10 gigahertz or a mesh fit or a p hemp it is never given why not. Because we learn this so early in our career we learn it in our first year or second year this hybrid pi model this gets ingrained into our blood. So, it is very easy to uh, do very easy to actually do the math and then figure out how the device will behave, but it is never given rather you will find some exotic models told like Tom 3, uh, Tri Queen's own model version 3 or Cartis 3 these kind of models are listed, where instead of small number of elements like it has got only very few elements so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 you start. Uh, encountering uh, models which has got more than 50 elements or at the very least around 20, 22 elements. So, what goes wrong when we start modeling for high frequency what is the trick here. So, that is what uh, we will try to capture. I will start with passive elements the simplest is a wire or a line. So, this probably is known to a lot of you, but just for the sake of completeness I have put it. So, a simple wire if I operate it at 10 megahertz uh, it is the lambda is only 0 0.063 percent of L let us say a very very small wire 1.27 centimeter long. So, you do not care about it and basically the it is basically a perfect short circuit it is basically a perfect short circuit at 10 megahertz does not give anything else not exactly perfect short circuit because it has got its own finite conductivity probably a very small resistance is associated with the wire. Uh, I have actually ignored the losses. So, these are all lossless representation. So, when you go to 100 megahertz then it is about it, it crops up to about a percent of the length the lambda is about 1 percent close to 1 percent. And as you can see at this kind of a uh, wavelength it will start showing up as an inductor instead of a plain short circuit. So, even a simple wire will start showing up as a circuit element in your design at a high enough frequency. If you go to 1 gigahertz then it becomes a transmission line with a periodic nature shunt C and C D is L it is about 6.3 percent. And now imagine what it will do if you take this frequency to 10 gigahertz. So, it will probably be acting like a filter 
a simple wire probably will start acting like a filter if you take it to 10 gigahertz. So, that is why uh, all your problems will come up at high frequency. So, uh, this is the equivalent circuit of a resistor that you will get at high frequency uh, x axis is frequency and then y axis is basically the impedance magnitude. Ideally it should not change with frequency a resistor is a frequency independent component it should not change, but it changes unfortunately uh, with a series inductor and a shunt capacitor. Now, where these originates where this series inductor and the shunt capacitor originates because it has got some kind of a lead on both side of the resistor. Even if you use an SMD resistor it will have some kind of a metallized pad for shouldering it into the circuit. So, that is a finite length of metal any finite length of metal will show up as an inductor at high frequency. At low frequency you do not care because your impedance is very very low j omega l is omega l is pretty low when omega is low, but when omega is high then this omega l starts going up and you will start seeing the effect of this fellow. And as you know as any signal propagates through a single wire there will be some fringing you cannot avoid fringing of fields if it is not totally inside something close like a waveguide or a coaxial line if it is on a single wire then it will start fringing. So, it will have some fringing field here some fringing field here and since both side is metal some field will start here electric field and eventually terminate here some field. So, what I am getting is I have metal here metal here in between I have air which is dielectric through which the field is getting terminated from one metal point to another metal wire which is essentially nothing but a capacitor. So, you end up with a shunt capacitor as well. So, this is the equivalent circuit of a resistor. So, up to a certain frequency you will not see anything, but beyond that these things will start rearing their ugly head and the device which the impedance of which should not change with frequency will actually change. So, it is same with a capacitor because capacitor has also got its own lead. So, it will have its inductance series inductance the resistance comes from two places uh, one is that the leads are not uh, infinite conductors they are finite conductors with finite conductivity. So, it will have its own resistance also the capacitor has got something called dielectric loss inside that means uh, when the when something AC this loss comes from two things actually one is the dielectric again is not a perfect dielectric inside a capacitor it has got a very small conductivity. So, there will be some conduction current flowing through the capacitor which is very small, but still it is a very very small conduction current. So, there will be some I square r loss because of that and second is dielectric loss because as you keep on increasing the frequency across the capacitor the voltage and current will not be aligned they will have some kind of a misalignment in the phase and because of that you will have some loss which is like kind of a power factor loss. So, that two losses combined will give rise to this resistor. So, let us ignore the resistor for the time being so, let us take these two. So, these two actually shows up as a series resonant circuit they does not behave like an ideal capacitor an ideal capacitor your impedance with increasing frequency should linearly go down and do nothing else, but that does not happen because at the same time your capacitive impedance is going down your inductive impedance is going up. So, at one point these two will actually cancel one other and you will end up with a resonance point beyond that the inductance will take precedence and it will start going up. So, beyond this point which we called SRF or self resonance frequency uh, it will behave like an inductor instead of a capacitor. So, that is the kind of problem that every arc designer uh, faces when they are working with this kind of circuit whether lumped or uh, distributed. Similarly, we can uh, construct a logic for inductor and inductor of course, let us consider a simple wire wound inductor. So, because of the wire it will have a resistor and this capacitor comes because they are interwinding capacitances uh, between windings you have some field. So, it is between again between two metal lines you have field going through here 
and originating from one and terminating into another. And so, uh, it will it gives rise to a lot of small, 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 small shunt capacitances which add up and they come up as a capacitance here total shunt capacitance. And as you can see this is a parallel resonance circuit. So, it will behave exactly like a parallel resonance circuit uh, as frequency goes up ideally the impedance should also go up linearly, but that does not happen. It will have resonance at some point then the capacitance will take precedence and the impedance will start going down. Now, uh, when you do this is a very uh, common thing that every circuit designer does is matching of impedance. So, essentially we know this all comes from the maximum power transfer theorem that uh, if you are having a resistive load then uh, your source resistance should match the load resistance. So, if it is purely resistive then you do not have a problem because then there is no angle involved in resistance there is no angle. So, it is like two perpendicularly cut water pipe you can simply add them join them together water will flow without any trouble. But whenever you have a complex termination which has got some kind of an imaginary part apart from the real part that imaginary part is going to present an angle. Okay, every imaginary part will present an angle electrically it will present an angle. So, your source uh, impedance needs to be matched in that way. So, that this is your matching part. So, it also needs to be cut in the same angle. So, when you match the two again water can flow nicely here power should flow. So, what is the effect of performance that you will get I, I have given a very simple low pass filter example. So, this is a low pass filter shunt capacitance series inductance and when you take the parasitic you remember the shunt a capacitance was a series resonance circuit and an inductance was a parallel resonance circuit. So, let us represent it with that equivalent circuit. So, beyond SRF if we go beyond self resonance frequency then we have seen from the previous slides that it will behave a capacitor will behave like an inductor and an inductor will behave like a capacitor. So, beyond that particular point it will uh, start acting like a high pass filter. So, you may start designing a low pass filter if your component choices are not proper or if you have not modeled the component properly for all the high frequency effects then you may end up with something entirely different than what you have intended. So, uh, some more complex examples of some passive components they are this is a shunt interdigital capacitor this is planar component that means, uh, this is a micro strip line as you can see there are fingers. So, the primary uh, capacitance is formed between the fingers and they are all in shunt. So, they add up. But unfortunately, when you model it, you will see a lot of additional components. These pads have got their own inductance and resistance. Then, since this is a metal pad, this is dielectric, you have metal at the bottom, some kind of capacitance will form because there will be some kind of field storage below this metal, and uh, same thing here. So, the equivalent circuit is something like this. So, you have these two inductance on both sides which comes in series, then this capacitance is on both sides which, which comes in shunt. For this fellow itself, this is the only thing that I wanted to make here. This is the capacitance which we started with in this whole design exercise, but then it will have its own associated resistance as well as inductance. So, as you can see, even wh when we try to make a simple interdigital capacitor, the equivalent circuit can look pretty daunting. So, these all these effects needs to be captured when you are designing at high frequency, because at high frequency the effects of all these will be very very prominent. So, some more uh, examples which are simpler than the previous one, this is simply a micro strip bend. This is a micro strip bend which you will use in abundance in all your circuit, any PCB that you design will have bends all your lines cannot be a straight line. Yes ma'am any query. So, all these bends they, they will have plenty of bends, but the bend you should remember is a discontinuity. That means, when the current flows here 
it does not get a straight path. So, the current needs to bend that means, there is some kind of a resistance for the current to flow from here to here at AC and inductance is basically resistance. So, uh, it will show up as two inductance from two side and anywhere you put a pad on a micro strip line it will have a capacitance. Okay. That is uh, pretty evident because even when you analyze micro strip earlier when, when people started analyzing micro strip even uh, using quasi static method then uh, the only characteristic thing that people determined was the capacitance for unit length with that basically you can characterize a micro strip line. So, this comes up with a shunt capacitance and this is a T junction a T discontinuity. So, instead of two inductance it will have three in all the three lines and a shunt capacitance. So, these are all the equivalent circuits that you need to use fortunately. Uh, when we started in 2000, 2001, then uh, things were not so easy. So, we used uh, closed form expressions for all these kind of discontinuities to figure out what is happening uh, all over. But nowadays, if you use a software like ADS or a microwave office, all the models are built in. So, you can pretty easily pull them up in your uh, design and all these things will be taken care. But what needs to be kept into mind when you are doing it is that there are two way of doing it. One is that you uh, make this a quasi static problem that means, uh, you think that the field is kind of not propagating and then you can analyze it with some simpler approach simpler mathematical approach and you can end up with a formula for this equivalent circuit the impedance or the admittance formula for the equivalent circuit. So, that can of course, be used because they are all linear elements. So, if you have a T junction followed by a bend you can simply add them in series and then you can get the response of both of them together. But what it does not catch is that if they are close enough some of the fringing field from this might be getting coupled to this through the substrate. So, that coupling is normally not taken care in this kind of quasi static approach. So, if you want to catch hold of that coupling also then you need to do a full electromagnetic simulation either 2.5 d or 3 d. So, that is where the designer needs to take a call that because this quasi static approach is simpler it takes less time it takes much much less time to do the math and then come out with some result. But when you are doing a full wave simulation a full wave electromagnetic simulation because your circuit may be pretty complex with lot of bends junctions and other things. So, uh, it might take a very very long time to do a full electromagnetic analysis. So, uh, we will start with uh, active elements which are let us say slightly uh, tricky or slightly difficult than the passive elements. Passive elements were pretty easy you can uh, almost qualitatively and discuss what is happening inside though quantitatively it is uh, slightly difficult. So, we we have different kind of devices like a HF transistor, MOSFET, HBT hemp etcetera etcetera. Simply it is not possible to discuss modeling of all of them they all have different approaches or even if the approach is same I mean the method is not exactly the same. So, what instead we will be discussing is the generic model types and linear and non-linear models. So, uh, what are the generic models and how do we model, how do we measure, how do we extract and they have their own uh, small signal as well as large signal characteristics. So, uh, we will start with a distributed small signal model of a FET. So, I have shown two different FETs here with package. So, this is an LDMOS which is almost ubiquitous in all of the base stations all of the cellular base stations LDMOS is the choice for power amplifier because it is very cheap to produce it is very reliable and with a very very long uh, MTBF mean time before failure. So, as you can see this is the package this is pretty large package because they generate a lot of heat the device is inside these three are the device then generally uh, it is taken to the lead by the means of wire bonds. So, the wire bonds are all shown here. Then in some cases for stabilizing uh, some kind of a embedded capacitor is used in some cases. 
and in most of the cases it is mounted on a ceramic substrate because uh, they have got good electrothermal characteristics. Uh, and these are the flanges through which generally you will screw it down, so that uh, you can give it a good heat sink, uh, it can generate the heat and take it away. Uh, compared to that this is a gallium nitride hemp high electron mobility transistor, it is much smaller, much tiny, but efficiency is very very high for this case. But they also have this kind of leads on both sides where you can give screws and then and they are generally the sources, these two are the sources and you have the gate and the drain. So, uh, when we actually model this kind of a device, what is the physical origin of the model? So, this is the physical origin of the model. So, as you can see I have shown in 3D uh, the source gate and drain of a device and since the source gate and drain all three has got metallization, they are uh, metallization to give you contact ohmic contact. So, they will have their own associated inductance and pad capacitance, uh, the gate will additionally have a resistance. Then this is the channel, so in this channel generally it will have their own gate to source capacitance and gate to drain capacitance as well as drain to source capacitance. The channel on its own acts like a current source which is uh, dependent on the transconductance of the device and the transit time. And, uh, it will have its own resistance channel resistance which is RDS. Uh, we need to remember that these elements some of these elements like this RDS, IDS etcetera they are bias dependent, they are not fixed, they are dependent on the point at which the device has been biased. Uh, so, this is the physical origin of the model and this is how we generally model it in a small signal condition. And if you are familiar with any uh, simulation software, you, if you have ever done any circuit simulation uh, for nonlinear devices, then you should be familiar with this kind of a structure, because the data sheet gives you all these values. The data sheet will give you all these values LG, RG, CPG, C. This is a particular model, the data sheet might follow some other kind of a model like a tri tone model or a Curtis model something like that, but they will all have this kind of uh, elements whose values are generally supplied. So, how can we start uh, building this kind of a small signal model from this kind of a structure? What is the correlation between this kind of a structure and this kind of an equivalent circuit? This is very important when you are doing uh, circuit design or component design at high frequency. So, as you can see the core of the device is represented only by this region. This region is the core of the device, all this outside comes because of the packaging. That means, this is the core device and this is the package. And the model also can be divided into these two parts, one is the core part and one is the package part. So, this core part is called the intrinsic part and this package part is called the extrinsic part and this is how they are related. So, normally these are the governing equations for extrinsic and intrinsic. This is the total admittance of that equivalent circuit which includes Y pad that is the pad all pad parasitics, then the R and L of the extrinsic and the admittance part of the intrinsic. So, this is how they are related and all of them are expanded below. So, this is the uh, Y pad, this is Z R L which actually if you see they are all with the external part R G R S L G L S. So, if you if we go back see L G R G L S R S they are all outside they are not in the intrinsic. And this is the intrinsic part which is mostly the capacitances. Uh, your CGS, CGB, CDS and your GM and tau. So, this is the intrinsic part. So, this is divided into these three parts, because it is easier to extract each of these values if we divide the whole circuit into this kind of three parts. So, how do we measure? 
these are the measurement tools which we use. So, uh, at a die level you can measure generally device are modeled at die level. It is pretty difficult to extract package parasitics though people do that also, but that is not very accurate. So, you use we use something called a wafer probe which is basically a very flat platform on which we can uh, put the device and then we use this kind of probes. They are ground signal ground coplanar probes. So, you can see three tips here and three tips here. So, this is ground signal ground so in our line. So, mostly uh, this coplanar line is ubiquitous in all kind of device modeling and design. So, you can basically put them directly onto the device and measure and if that is not possible in some cases it is not possible to directly probe onto the device and measure then you need some kind of an additional structure where you can you can see three pads here 1, 2 and 3 they are for that ground signal and ground for the input and output and then you can take the signal and then connect it with the device using some kind of bond wires and then you can probe here and here. So, this is how normally the measurement is done. If uh, it is a very very complex circuit with lot of inputs and outputs then instead of single probes probe cards are used where you have lot of probes taken together into one single structure with all feeding parallelly either signal or bias. Now, uh, as you can see this kind of a measurement poses a problem to us. Now, what is the problem? The problem is I want to measure the characteristic of the device, the device is here, but uh, my measurement is being done here and here. So, there is additional structure, this structure as well as bond wires coming in between my measurement plane and the device. So, whatever I measure it will include the effect of these bond wires and this additional structure, but I do not want that. I want only the characteristic of the device. So, how do I come from here to here that is explained in the next slide. Essentially we use some kind of a D embedding. Okay. So, what we do in D embedding is this gray blue gray thing is by device then this is attached on this kind of a structure and then I can have my ground signal ground and ground signal ground here. Then this whole structure can be represented by this network. So, we have this z pad and y pad then this works like a transmission line, this is also a transmission line and this is again my z pad and y pad and in between all these my d u t sits. So, for all these different different boxes we can figure out what are the a b c d parameters we can measure them separately, we can make this structure isolated without the device measure them separately and then figure out what is the s parameter. Once we figure out what the scattering parameters are it is trivial to convert them into a b c d parameters. Why a b c d parameters? Because there is a transmission line and we can simply add them that is the biggest advantage of using a b c d parameters. So, these are as you can see these are the matrices given for the a b c d parameter. So, in this when I will measure I will measure here and measure here. So, I am going to get the cumulative result of this whole stuff. Now, from this I need to take this 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 and this out and only then I will come up with a d which is the device matrix whatever we are measuring for the device. So, these are separately measured and then these are taken out of the total measurement. So, this is called D embedding and though it does not look very intimidating it may look even deceptively simple, but my experience is this is a very very complicated process. This is not very easy to D embed a device and measure you will end up with a lot of issues and if you are trying to measure at a high frequency as high as 60 gigahertz your dimension will start running into sub millimeters for all these kind of pads. So, uh, uh, we will talk about a small signal model a bit more, but before that these are the types of model that we generally uh, use nowadays. 
what are the large signal models that we use nowadays these are the general models we have uh, this is slightly wrongly printed this physical model behavioral model and lastly compact model so what are the difference between the three uh, physically this physical model what it does is it solves the transport equation inside the device so you start with probably poisson's equation and then put all kind of boundary conditions for all the layers and then solve it using some kind of a numerical technique like runge kutta or uh, this kind of differential equation sol uh, solving engine and then you can end up with a physical model now this physical model is very important for device designers those who are actually designing the device itself because they need to know what is happening inside the device and how it is happening in every layer but for a circuit designer this is kind of an overkill as a circuit designer you are primarily concerned about the input output relationship of the device you don't venture into what is happening inside probably in the course of your btech or mtech you have learnt it but when you are actually working with the device you only want to know what is the voltage current relationship between terminals and if at a particular voltage current you feed some power at some terminal what is going to come out of the other terminal so that's what you want to know at all so this is an overkill so this is very very complex and very very time consuming to extract as well as run in a circuit simulation so though they are they will give you a lot of physical insight what is the physics happening inside other kind is completely polar opposite which is a behavioral model so behavioral model means you treat the device as a black box you don't care about anything and you measure for as wide a range as possible as many bias points as possible as many frequency points as possible and whatever and then try to fit that data into some kind of a power series equation so once you do that then you get a model uh, which is within the measurement domain very very robust that means if you are using the device within the range in which you have done your measurement then it's a very very robust model but there are two downsides of this model what are the downsides one downside is that you require a lot of measurements okay a very very long list of measurements are required very fine grain measurements because within your measurement domain it is going to use interpolation to predict all the data now the problem comes when you are trying to take it outside your measurement domain let us say you have measured it for a gate voltage of 0 to minus 2.5 now you want to know how the device will behave if you apply a gate voltage of minus 3 so that is you have not measured at all so it's not in your data set so what it will do is it will extrapolate and extrapolation is always sort with errors so you can end up with a model which is non physical it's physically not possible because any this is this kind of behavioral model has got another name they are also called macro models so macro model has got two primary issues that you need to address one is stability and the second one is causality so outside the measurement domain it's very very difficult to ensure stability and causality both so it has got its own limitation though the modeling process is very easy because you are only doing terminal measurements and nowadays with automated test instruments you can do a lot of measurements in a small amount of time so from ease of modeling this red is basically your behavioral model but as you can see the extrapolation accuracy is very very poor then convergence is not good operating range is less there is absolutely no physical insight but they are readily available for use in any circuit design physical model is as you can see kind of polar opposite to this wide operating range very good extrapolation accuracy very good physical insight convergence is also good but the modeling is exceedingly complex and then usability in a circuit design is not good its usability is good in device design but not in circuit design so these were done by physicists and these were done by measurement specialists so engineers came up with some kind of a compromise which is a compact model so as you can see compact model is this green hexagon 
it is close to every one of them, every one of the criteria convergence, operating range, physical insight, usability, easy modeling process, extrapolation, accuracy, but you see it is nowhere near the best in anything, but still it is the most widely used, most popular model in circuit design. So, today whatever modeling we are talking about is basically for compact model. So, some of the commercial compact set models that you will use if you use a software like ADS advanced design system or uh, something like AWR microwave office, then you will come up with these models uh, pretty often. Curtis, Curtis is name of one engineer who derived this device, this model. Uh, as you can see they have got 59, it has got 59 parameters, but it cannot catch any electrothermal effect. We will talk about trapping effect later. So, this is the original device for which it was done, gallium arsenide FET. Then C FET, E HEMP, Angelov is very popular for gallium nitride. It is the model to use for, to be used for gallium nitride HEMP. The first model which, which captured all of the aspects of gallium nitride HEMP. And this is some other commercial model, which is also used for gallium nitride hemp. So, when Angelov started, then the number of parameters were just 21. It is about uh, 9 years back, but lot of people have worked on it over these 9 years and now the number of elements has increased to 80. So, they catch all sort of different effects. Okay, so, this is the compact FET model extraction flow, how do we do it? Generally, it always start with the extraction of small signal and I will take you through at least one or two parameters, how can we extract. So, it starts with small measurements and very low frequency measurements. So, you can get all this, then you can go for an IV model, where you figure out what is the dependency of the current along with the voltage that is IDS, how it is changing with VGS and VDS is pretty obvious. Then you have nonlinear capacitances which are not only uh, which are dependent on the voltage. So, CGS is a function of VGS and CGD is a function of VGD. This is not true when you are in the small signal domain. So, in the small signal you can ignore this, but when you are in large signal then you need to figure out these voltage dependencies. Then uh, if it is for a power device then you need to do a thermal model like when you operate the device will heat up during operation and that heating of the device will change some of its characteristics. So, you need to take that into account and if it is particularly a hemp device, high power hemp device, then probably you would like to catch hold of the trapping effect as well. Uh, we will discuss a bit what the trapping effect is. So, this is the flow and generally uh, this is how it is measured. Uh, it is always measured in pulsed IV, pulsed S parameter format. And then uh, you do a bias dependent S parameter, which is a multi bias set of linear models. Always remember when I say linear models, I mean a small signal model. So, small signal to large signal is basically finding out small signal models at many, many different bias points and then combining all of the data together into one big model, which is going to give you the nonlinear stuff. So, uh, why uh, do we require pulse IV and pulse test parameter? Why cannot we simply bias it and then measure? It is a critical question to answer. Why cannot we simply bias it with DC and then measure away the S parameters? Why do we require pulsed measurement? So, the primary idea is that uh, whatever measurements we are doing, they should be isothermal. That means, the device temperature or the junction temperature should not change appreciably over your measurement period, over your measurement time. But if you push through a DC current, let us say through the drain source of a device, the device will heat up obviously. So, it will have its own thermal characteristic kicking in and then the device characteristics will change, but you do not want that in the terminal IV or S parameter measurement, because for that we will be accounting separately a thermal model. So, we want a model which is without the thermal effects. So, how can we catch a model without the thermal effects? We can make like here some examples are given how they keep on shifting. 
like it is a 50 nanosecond pulse 20 percent self heating. So, as you can see the point is shifting constantly because of the heat. So, uh, we need to do a pulse measurement that means, we can put a small DC pulse measure inside that and switch off the device for a long period allow it to cool down. Then again we put on a pulse and measure again okay. and that way why do we need to measure again because probably with one measurement you are not going to get any meaningful data you need to have many many measurement to average over the noise as we will see very soon. So, uh, these are the kind of noise that you get when you do a pulse measurement. So, this is the peak to peak noise with wide band detection that means, when you do a wide band pulse then uh, these are the kind of noise that you will reach. So, how you can reduce the noise you can average because as we know uh, the auto correlation of noise is 0 when I am averaging I am essentially correlating and noise will not correlate. So, when you average this noise goes down. So, this is one of the critical aspect of measurement that when you are measuring you need to do a large averaging. It slows down the measurement appreciably, but this is the only way to get good data. And same thing you can see in the dynamic range of the measurement. So, this is basically a filter whose response is shown as you can see the noise floor is quite high it is around 30 to around that but when you do a lot of averaging then you can see the same noise floor has gone down appreciably. You have a wider dynamic range you can measure very cleanly from here to here, but in this case if some signal comes here some measurement data comes here because it is buried under noise you will be not be able to measure it. So, this averaging it does improves your dynamic range of measurement this is also very very important. When it will reduce noise floor. This is reducing the noise of your system measurement system. It is not reducing the noise of your device. Okay, the system will have its own noise floor and under normal condition you cannot measure anything below your system noise floor. If any signal comes below your system noise floor your system will not be able to detect it. So, you can switch on averaging which reduces your system noise floor. Yes, you can take 20 measurements, add them up divided by 20. So, what happens here your measurement is always meaningful. Okay. So, if you add it 20 times and divide it by 20 you are going to get the same thing, but here in one measurement it will be a peak in another measurement it will be a dip because it is random. So, when you add them up the peak and the dip cancels each other and when you average then this fellow will go down further that is how it happens. Is it clear? So, uh, this is how it is done. So, you need to synchronize between pulsed IV and pulsed S parameters. So, you will give a gate pulse then a drain pulse and the DC measurement window. So, for DC measurement as you can see uh, for any fit your gate needs to be biased first. So, that is why the pulse is wider then your drain comes in and can anybody tell me why this DC measurement window is shifted to the right would it not be prudent if we take the measurement right in the middle. Instead of that the measurement window is shifted to the right this small green pulse. Do not you want your device to settle? When you switch on a pulse the device will start in a transient mode, then it will take some time to reach the steady state condition. You want the measurement in steady state condition not in a transient condition. So, that is why I am allowing the device to settle a bit here and then taking the measurement. Similarly, uh, this is what is done when you do the RF measurement. So, the source is applied at a wider pulse and the response is taken at a narrower pulse. So, this is your source window and this is your 
V n A window. Uh, because again it is the same thing you want when you apply an RF you want your device to settle. You do not want to measure transient test parameters you want to measure steady state test parameters. So, that is why, but here the uh, settling is faster. So, we can get away with measuring at the middle. So, uh, how do we extract parameters? If we go back to my original equivalent circuit, this was the original equivalent circuit. Uh, each of these elements needs to be figured out from measurement. So, how do we do that? Because I have only three terminals, I have only this gate, drain, and source these are the three terminals available to me that is all is available to me, but from that three terminals I need to figure out all these values. So, how do we do that? Okay. So, as I was telling we will divide it into intrinsic and extrinsic. So, the intrinsic is taken as a black box first this is the intrinsic and these are all the extrinsic part L g R g C p g p g means p means pad. So, when I am telling it C p g that means, it is the capacitance at the gate due to the gate pad. Uh, same with drain capacitance at the drain due to the drain pad and L g and R g they are inductance and resistance. So, uh, this is the flow uh, that okay, fine let me go to the next slide to value. So, what we do is I am giving example for only one measurement because I cannot take you through all the components it will take a lot long long time, but just to give an idea how it is done. So, there this method for measuring is called cold fit method and we figure out C G S and C G D. Okay. So, what we what is done is that the drain is biased at 0 volt and the gate is biased below pinch off that is how it is biased. So, when the drain is biased at 0 volt then there is no current flowing through the drain that means, the current source that was there in my equivalent circuit this was the current source this I have taken away because I have biased it at 0 volt it is no longer there. And since the gate is also below pinch off, then the act there is no act active area under gate. So, your G m that is the transconductance and G d that is the conductance of the drain will cancel each other, because there is no active area under gate I have put it below pinch off. So, these two are then represented by C b 1 and C b 2 this C b 2 and C b 1 and if the capacitances are small enough then we can ignore the inductance and resistance. So, your equivalent circuit under this particular bias conditions becomes very very simple rather than that complex equivalent circuit with which we start. Then we can measure the S parameters between gate and drain and then readily convert them into Y parameter. Once we convert them into Y parameter then that y matrix directly give me the measure of the capacitances. This y 1 1 is essentially all these three taken together as you can see y 1 1 is your this all these taken together all three because they are all in shunt. Then uh, y 1 2 is only what is there in the middle because this this one and outside that is the y 2 2 is the uh, shunt combination of all the three capacitances that is there at the output side. So, this is very very simple elementary algebra and because this symmetry is not because of the circuit this is because of the device uh, this we can uh, designate with one capacitance C b 1 equals C b 2 and then your this becomes further simplified these equations become simplified further and then from this you can directly figure out all these three capacitances. Okay. So, you see this is the trick that is applied by all device modeling people bias it at a certain region. So, that half the effects are gone in the equivalent circuit then measure the rest 
and extract it. That is what it is done. Likewise, I have not shown, but I will just tell. If you want to figure out the R and Z, R and L, you need to do another measurement in which the drain is biased at 0 volt and the gate is forward biased instead of reverse biased. So, when you bias it in this condition, then the capacitances will vanish and then what you are left with are R and L. You can measure an S parameter between the two ports, convert it into Z parameter and then extract all the R and L from the Z parameter likewise. So, this is how it is done in the small signal domain. Is it understood? This topic may be slightly, I mean I would like to say this is not very well uh, discussed among academicians or even in the industry, uh, slightly uh, out of the domain knowledge. So, uh, I am trying to give you a flavor how it is done, but without this kind of an exercise, uh, we cannot actually meaningfully do our design as we will learn eventually in other lectures. Okay, that is why I have started with this. This is the most difficult of all the three. So, once we have done that, then uh, we can do a bias dependent S parameter. So, it gives me a multi bias set of linear models. That means, that particular linear model I can extract at a particular bias, though uh, this basically are not uh, bias dependent, but there are other parameters which are bias dependent like your GM is a bias dependent value. So, all those things can be extracted at different bias points and those multi bias set of linear models will eventually lead you to a non-linear model. This is very complex, so I am not going inside this, it will take a lot of time probably 3 hours to discuss only this. So, this part I am purposefully ignoring. Then uh, we can probably we would like to catch other effects like the self heating, the thermal model and trapping as well as nonlinear capacitances. So, just to show you uh, this C G D is a very strong function of V G D when you are taking it into large signal domain and C G S is a very strong function of V G S in the large signal domain again. This will not be so in the small signal parts, but uh, so, I have just shown you for as you, as you can see that C G D changes appreciably along with V D S. And then similarly your C G S also changes appreciably along with V G S. So, these are the nonlinear effects that you need to catch if you are trying to uh, kind of do a nonlinear or a large signal model. So, from there we come to this thermal effects. So, the thermal effect can be of two type, one is static self heating, another one is dynamic self heating. So, this is static self heating. So, what it does is uh, ideally your graph should be like this. So, as you increase your V d s, your current should increase, keep on increasing, but that does not happen. If you take it to a very high temperature or a relatively higher temperature, then eventually at one point the current will start to fall instead of increasing. This is called current collapse. Okay, this is very typical characteristic of a gallium nitride hemp. So, this is this happens because your ambient temperature is high. This happens because the ambient temperature at which you are working is high. Okay, this might happen if you take your component or communication system or radar in Thor desert ambient temperature is 55 degree centigrade. So, it will behave differently than in your lab where the ambient temperature is around 25. There is a 30 degree temperature difference. So, this will collapse. The second effect is because it is dynamic. Dynamic means as you are pushing R f power through your device, it is giving you an amplified output, but it has got a finite efficiency. So, even with gallium nitride probably you will end up with around 40, 50 percent of efficiency. That means, 50 percent of the DC power is getting converted into heat. So, that heat which is generated due to dynamic condition will also heat up your device. For that it does not require any help of ambient and that will also show up. So, it is shown up here 
as you can see the pulses has started here, but it has started going up slightly. So, how they are captured? They are captured using this kind of an equivalent circuit. So, the total thermal uh, or the self heating extraction it is uh, approximated using this kind of a formula, which again can be approximated using a this kind of parallel R C cells. This is then added to the total circuit. So, when you try to capture your heating effect, this circuit will be added to the original equivalent circuit, which I have shown. So, now you can understand why when it started with some 20, 22 elements, it has gone up to some 50, 55 elements. As you try to capture more and more effects, so more and more circuit elements will be added to your model. So, this is trapping. So, what is trapping? Uh, trapping is uh, because every uh, material that you use like gallium nitride, gallium arsenide, it will have some lattice defects. You cannot have a material with 0 lattice defects. Now, under normal condition these lattice defects will not create much problem, but when you are pushing very high power that means, very high current lot of electrons are going through it. This traps some of the electrons will be uh, captured in those traps in those lattice defects and they will not be able to come out. So, when you push very high current instead of current going up it will start going down because of this effect. So, as I was telling current collapse this happens because both trapping and heat and this will actually result in lag. So, uh, as you can see this is the green one is uh, normal and the red one is basically with uh, trapping effect. So, this is not catching up, this is not able to catch up with the normal DC bias characteristic, it is lagging behind, lagging below. Okay. So, this happens. So, this happens at both gate and drain and uh, this can severely uh, limit the device operation. So, uh, this again this as I was telling this starts happening when uh, you try to push a lot of current through the device. So, these effects are dependent on bias. So, you need to catch uh, this kind of bias dependence of trapping effect and then put them into uh, your model. So, this is this shows the difference like this is the I D S versus P in. So, this red is basically without traps and this blue is with traps. So, as you can see the I D S is basically decreasing when I take the trap into account it decreases. Similarly, with P out it is P in versus P out. So, without the trap I can get a higher power when I take the traps into account it basically pushes the power down. So, uh, the point of all this discussion all this what we have done in about I think past 1 hour or so is that when you are doing it at a very high frequency all these things needs to be taken care of. Whether you are working with passives, whether you are working with actives all the different phenomena that is happening inside will start kicking in and at high frequency high power they have they can have profound effect on the total circuit and you will end up with something else than what you have intended. So, okay, so this probably uh, once you do the model you need to do a validation. So, validation is done by uh, again I uh, will come to this. Normally, it is done by measuring the S parameters that means, uh, from the model what you have extracted you can find out the S parameters, you can calculate the S parameters and you can measure the S parameters of the device itself. Those two you need to put side by side and see whether whatever your model is predicting and whatever you are measuring whether they are matching or not. So, if they are matching well within your frequency range within the bias range you want to uh, work with then it is a good model for you. If it is not then you need to go back and then probably start modeling once more and extract a more accurate model. Okay. So, I think with this uh, I will end this uh, modeling lecture, uh, I am open for any question.
there can be only one meaning if there are no questions. <laughs> Either everybody has understood everything, that is why there is absolutely no question and the other one is nobody is interested. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of candidates which are suitable for high frequency. If you only uh, point out at the frequency and nothing else, then probably I would tell you that. Uh